all hearts and minds agreed. If you will rise to your feet, we're coming from the. I'm kind of. <laughs> I realized it the, the other day. I preached uh, today's sermon last Sunday and this sermon this Sunday. So in your packet, if you had your packet, I was on. I was on the page, a uh, page ahead, and um. I'm going back and retract, you know, just go back one. So, but we're coming from the book of First Chronicles. I'm, I'm going to lift up verse 35 as my Semitic text. And while you're finding First Chronicles, it comes after Second Kings and it's before Second Chronicles. And basically, the secret about First Chronicles and well, the book of Chronicles and the book of Kings is that it's the same book, but here's the difference. One talks about it historically and God's hand, first Kings, Kings, the book of Kings is historical recording of everything that the Kings had done. And then Chronicles is the divine meaning. We know God's hand was in all of these things moving historically moving the kings to do what they did but then we take back as Paul as Paul Harvey would say the rest of the story you know they don't record in first and first kings David's mistakes we always talk about first Samuel and second Samuel with things David done but it's recorded in first chronicles one of David's biggest mistakes you know you thought well he murdered Uriah and slept with Bathsheba yeah yeah he did that but then he did something even more more bad or more worse so if you could say it like that more worse sir. yeah I'll, I'll speak like my kids do more worse sir, mr. Stewart yeah more worse sir. it's the idea that there's, there's so much in first chronicles and second chronicles as well if you have a say amen Minerva what page would that be on in the packet in, in the in the packet you got the packet what page is it? what page 34 page 34 if you have page 34 and it says the following verse 35 and say ye, save us, O God, of our salvation, and gather us together, and deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name, and glory in thy praise. I'm going to read that just one more time. And say ye, save us, O God, of our salvation. And gather us together and deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name and glory in thy praise. Please be seated with me and pray with me now. Lord, we thank you right now for this day. Lord, we thank you right now for this season. Lord, let us continually have a heart to praise you, a heart to give thanks to you. In spite of what may be going on around us, despite our circumstances or situations or whatever is going on in our lives that may be a distraction from thanking you, we should always have a heart to say thank you. We should always have a mindset to be thankful, our attitude of gratitude in spite of what is going on. You tell us in the scripture to always be thankful in all situations, be thankful at all times. Even when we don't feel like being thankful, we are told by you, commanded by you to be thankful. So Father God, let us reflect upon your goodness and your grace and your mercy and your love during this time of Thanksgiving. Father God, let us see what you have to say about thankfulness. Let us see what we have to learn from this word, from this scripture right here, right now in this text. And right now, Lord, be with that person who wants to give their life to Christ, Lord. Move the Holy Spirit, Lord. Let it move throughout the congregation and touch the heart of someone who does not know you for the forgiveness of their sins or for salvation, Father God. Move them now, Lord. We give thanks in advance for that person who wants to come to Jesus, for that person who wants to join our church. Right now, Lord, let my congregation see you and hear you. Make me small, but you become greater in me. We pray this now in your son Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Once again, giving honor to God, to the saints in Christ. We're just going to quickly lift up that scripture right there where it says that we may give thanks to thy holy name and glory in thy praise. Give thanks to thy name. Give thanks to thy holy name. I like to speak from the thought this morning. Give thanks to your name. 
give thanks to your name. Turn and smile at your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh my neighbor, thank you for all you do. Now just think about it for a moment. There may have been times in your life, and just reflect upon it, where you received an unexpected blessing and did not know who to give credit to, Kevin. You did not know who to give thanks to, Trish. You, 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 you had these thoughts. You found this present. You found this gift. You found this item. And it wasn't FedEx. It wasn't UPS. And it wasn't Amazon who dropped it on your doorstep by accident for your neighbor next door. No, it was meant for you. You see, Vance... In chapter 16 of 1 Chronicles is a combination of Psalms 95, Psalm 105, and Psalm 106. And we see David honoring God, giving him credit to his name. Now there are two things in the chapter 16 of 1 Chronicles. David is first calling the people, his people, the people that he's been called to lead, to give God praise. You see, Miss Carol, the second thing is he's reminding people. He's trying to remind them to remember God's wonderful deeds that he's already done, currently doing, and going to do in the future. And to give him thanks in advance and right now for what he's done. And we see that exactly here today in the text. Let's take a look at it for, for a second, looking at verses 33, 30 through 33. And it says in verse 30, fear before him, all ye earth, move all the earth, the world also shall be stable, that it not be moved. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice, and let men say among the nations, the Lord reigneth. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the fields rejoice in all that is therein. Verse 33. Then shall the trees of the wood sing out at the presence of the Lord, because he cometh to judge the earth. And to help you understand this text clearly, let me give you three for the Trinity. My first point, when giving thanks to God's name, we see his creation and we see a long word, anthropomorphism. Crystal, leave that one up there. That's a Scrabble word that we need to use someday. You never know when you're going to get those letters when you play Scrabble. And we hear the anthem of praise. We see his creation. Everywhere you go with your eyes, you see what God has created. You look at your fingers, you look at your children, your grandchildren, you look at your house, you look out there and see the strawberries growing. We see his creation, the blue skies, the birds, the hawk crying out. We see the anthropomorphism and we hear the anthem of praise. So while we record this, think about it for a second. Verse 30 says to us, all the earth, the world, but notice the stability of all the earth. Notice the world shall be stable, that it, it be not moved. Why? Why is that possible? Because God is in control. You see, Ms. Sheila, verse 31 says, we see the heavens and the earth, men and their nations. But notice one thing about the men and their nations. They stop to recognize, Miss Lorraine, who is ruling over everything. It says in the text, the Lord reigns. Now think about that for a second. The earth recognizes God is in control. And then even man stops to recognize that God is in control because they realize, and we all should come to that rationalization of, the Lord reigns. Go ahead and hit the slide, Miss Crystal. And we see verse 32, we see the sea, we see the fields, and we see the trees in verse 33 in the forest, or the scripture says wood. Now, it's in a singular form, but they use the singular form to represent, don't ask me, King James, it says the wood, but that means the forest. So the trees in the forest, the seas, the fields, all of this creation of God. But notice back in verse 30, it says, all of God creation is fearing him. This is an aspect of giving human attributes to something that's not alive. It's called anthropomorphism. Now let me explain what that is. It is derived from two Greek words. 
You see, anthro means human. Morphe means form. It gives, it means to give, when you put it all together, to give attribution of human characteristics or emotions or behavior to animals or to non-human things, such as the earth, plants, supernatural beings, the sky, the moon, all these things that are not living. Now, how do we know this is happening? Go back in the text and look at verse 30. It says, fear before him. But who's supposed to fear him? All the earth. Now, fear is an emotion. Can the earth really experience fear? Brother Mike, yes, yes it can. It says, you can experience fear because why? We know who our creator is. Our creator is God. Now, we're the only ones that won't acknowledge who God is. But the earth is able to acknowledge God. Look at the text. Everything created by God knows that God created it. And even it acknowledges him as the creator. Now, I know somebody doesn't believe me. So let's pause for a minute from a word from our sponsor, the Bible. Look at verse 30 one more time. All the earth, the world, also shall be what? Stable, that it not be moved. Meaning, the world knows and recognizes who is in control. It knows who is controlling it, not to go out of control, spin out of, out of control, but remain stable and not be moved. All creation knows it is God. See, Brother Paul... Everything that has breath should praise the Lord. But there's no breath here in the earth. It's just a solid form. Let's dig a little deeper into this anthropomorphic trace assigned to creation. Looking at verses 31, 32, and 33. It says, let the heavens be what? Glad. Let the earth do what? Rejoice. Again, emotions, human feelings of happiness and joy. But it gets better. Verse 32, let the sea roar and let the fields rejoice. Roar? How are they roaring? Brother Vance, they're roaring with praise. Fields rejoicing. What? Feeling joy. But look at the trees. Verse 33. The trees of the woods sing out the forest. Look what they're singing about. The presence of the Lord. Come on, give God some glory right there. When the presence of the Lord, as he is moving through, as he is passing by, the trees, the woods sing out at the presence of the Lord. Nancy, we're seeing everything that has breath give God praise. Everything created that can't even speak praises God. Y'all remember way back in Matthew, Mark, Luke? Jesus told the Pharisees that if you shut the mouths of the people, the rocks will cry out and give God glory. But let me be clear about the reason why. Everything in these verses are fearing God. It is the reverence fear. It is the love of God. It is who he is as the creator. And because of that, look at the last part of verse 33. Here's the real reason why fear comes in. The words, because he has cometh to judge the earth. Brothers and sisters, today, you better believe two things. First, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And you can't get to the Father except through Him. So the only way you can be saved is by believing in Him. Jim, the second thing you better believe is that He is coming back to judge both the quick, meaning those who are alive, and the dead, those who have died before us. Everyone will stand in judgment. These two things will happen someday. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess, Miss Rebecca, that he is Lord. But Brother Paul, don't miss this. Let's listen to the anthem being sung by all creation. There's an anthem. There's a mantra. There's a song being sung. And listen to the theme of that song. It's a theme of joy. Look at the text, verse 31. 
Let the heavens be what? Glad. Let the earth do what? Rejoice. And let the men, men say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Verse 32, let the, earth, let the sea roar and let the fields rejoice. What the phrases, the fullness thereof, and the phrases, all that is therein means is this. The seas itself, all seven seas, and everything living in it, and also in the fields, meaning in the fields, in the valleys, in the plains, everywhere in itself are praising God, and everything living in it gives God praise. Come on, people of God, give God the glory. You see, verse 33 is clear. Then shall the trees of the woods sing out at the presence of the Lord. The trees and the whole forest sing out because of God's goodness. That reminds me of that time when that little girl Snow White was walking around and she's whistling and the little birdies are singing and the, and the little deer are running around. All these things are giving God praise. Everything created by God is giving praise. Creation is joyfully, willingly, freely giving God glory for all that God is. Come on now. And their praise, watch this, their praise is in the purest form. Meaning, we, the people of God, should follow creation's example and give God glory for being God. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. You see, here's the thing. If all creation can give God praise, why can't we? Why can't we? See, what God does and have to do, what does God do and have to do to get praise from us? What does God have to do to get recognition from us? From man, his created being. We know we were created by God to give God praise because when the devil lost his job as the praise worship leader of heaven, we were created to give God glory. What does God have to do to get that from us? Let me give you an example real quick about how we should look at God and reverence God. When was the last time you saw a policeman? And you respect the policeman because of the following things. You give him the honor due to him because he has a badge that tells you who he is. He has a uniform that you recognize. And what it represents is protection and the law. You know him for his protection and law because of the badge and the uniform. But when a police officer takes off their uniform and they take off their badge, you don't know who they are anymore. They just look like a regular person. And you see, Miss Geraldine, here's the thing. God never removed moves his uniform of divinity nor does he take off his badge of holiness he will always be the glorious creator and redeemer he always deserves our praise and our worship and our adoration and love it never ceases he never stops being who he is once again, police officers can take off their uniform, but God never takes off who and what he is. Holy, pure, loving, kind. All the things we love and worship and adore him for. But this is where we see our second point. We are witnesses to God's character, and we are grateful because he is merciful. Somebody should have shot it right there. When you look back over your life and think about some of the bad things you've done, you might want to say, thank God for his mercy. You might want to thank God for his mercy. Look at verse 34. It says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Just think about why you're grateful today. We're grateful because he is good. That's his character. His mercy endures forever. That's just part of who he is. That's his character. That's his nature. That's, that's his very essence of who God is. And that's the best reason to be grateful because of God's mercy. He's holding back from us the punishment we deserve. Ooh, thank God for that. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his grace. Why? How long does it last? Because it endures forever. Oh, hold on for a second. Put your seatbelt on. Here we go. It's not limited. It doesn't expire, nor does it require you to go renew the warranty, go out and purchase an extended guarantee, go out and beg for it, go out and cry for it, whine about needing more time. Because we know when it comes to warranties and guarantees, they all have an expiration date. But look at the Lord. 
his mercy and his grace and his love and his goodness. Watch how long it endures. Endures and lasts forever. I don't see no expiration date on that. You look at your milk card and it'll say November 20th, November 30th. Um, it might say December 5th. There's an expiration date. But God's grace, God's mercy, God's love endures and lasts forever. Don't miss this length of time. Don't miss the permanency of God's mercy. It will never run out. It will never be temporary. But it lasts. It continues. It persists. It prevails. It remains. Look what it does. It endures. Somebody say forever. That's how long. I love Limitations 3 and 23. It says, though the mercies, Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. But here's the best part. Verse 23. They are new every morning. My favorite verse. Great is your faithfulness. You see, here's the thing. There are times we stop being faithful, but God never stops being faithful. We live in a world where we are bombarded daily with spam likely calls. Raise your hand if they keep calling your phone. Have mercy. They want you to buy an extended warranty. They want you to come look at this. They want you to come give money to that. But we serve a God who gives us everything freely. You see, Ms. Jan, it brings me right back to the consistent character of God. He is always good. There has never been a time when God was ever bad. Oh, I've been bad all my little life. There have been plenty of times when I've been bad. I thank God, because look at the text, that he's always been good. And here's the best part. I thank God that when I have been bad, that his mercy endures forever. Because when I've been bad, God has been good. By sending his son, say his sweet name with me. Somebody say Jesus. You see, God has set the example. God has given us a standard. God has showed us the model that we're supposed to follow in his son, Jesus. And he teaches us that. Miss Minerva, he provided a living, breathing example for us to follow. And what did we do to that? We killed his only begotten son as our sick way of saying thanks for your mercy. Really, that's what we did. History has shown, history has proven, history has shown that we are thankless wretches that deserves God's punishment. But Romans 5, 8 and 6 says, for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Let me be clear about that part right there. Before you came to Jesus, that was you and me. We were the ungodly that Christ died for. You see, Crystal, the best part about that is verse 8. But God demonstrates, meaning God shows us, God proves us that in his own love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But if that's not enough to prove to you how much God loves you, Revelations 1, 5 says, From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over kings of the earth, to him who loved us, have mercy, washed us from our sins in his own blood. Your salvation is quite personal to Jesus. You know how you know it's personal? Because he washed us in his own blood. He got rid of our stain of sin and cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Nobody Nobody missed us. Nobody missed us. It's the blood of Jesus that reconciles. It's the blood of Jesus that corrects, brings us, represents us, presents us before the Father as clean because we believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins and for everlasting life. And because of that, we can shout. Because of that, I didn't hear nobody give thanks. Because of that, we can shout. Because of that, we can give God glory to his name. But hold on a minute. Look at verse 34 one more time. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endure forever. Can we say that as a congregation together? Can we say that and mean it? Can we say that in our hearts and truly be thankful? Let's do it on the count of three. One, two, three. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and for his mercy endures forever. Before I review, I want you to notice one thing. The word is. It's capitalized. It's bolded. I pause it right there because, let me just teach the English real quick. 
Is is the to be form, and it's in the present tense. When David wrote this scripture, when David wrote this little piece for us, he recognized God is going to be good right then at his time, 2,000 plus years ago. And God is what? Is still good 2,000 years later. And let me be clear about one thing. If God allows time to continue on for another 2,000 years, he's still going to be good. Is is always going to be what God is. God is good. Come on, give him some glory right now. But let's review. If you didn't catch this word, remember it for Scrabble. We see his creation. We see the anthropomorphism. I had to work on that because that's a mouthful right there. I had to, I had to spread it out and put it in little things like that. And we hear the anthem. My second point, we are witnesses to God's character and we are grateful because he is merciful. But here's the part that I want to ask everybody today. Are you content? Are you content? Being contented means, and then notice this on the ED. It's in the past tense. Meaning, when you look over your life, the bad, the good, and all the ugly, you're still thankful. You're still thankful. You're still thankful. Come on, somebody. You're still thankful. You see, we're contented because of our blessings of salvation. That's a blessing. And we must bless our sacred Lord. Just think about it for a second. You, you, you got to think about why we are here. We're here to worship and praise. We're here to give God glory. But reflect upon one thing in the time of Thanksgiving. We're contented. That's past tense. Even tomorrow, you're still going to be contented in the present tense because of who God is. You see, you got to have a heart of thanksgiving. you got to have a heart to say, thank you, Lord. Even no matter what it is you're going through, you got to be contented. I have a sermon about that with Paul another day, but today we're going to stay right here. Look at verse 35, and it says... Say ye, save us, O God of our salvation, and gather us together and deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name and, and glory in thy praise. Verse 36 says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel forever and ever. And all the people said, Amen. And praise the Lord. Now, we are contented. How do we know we are contented? Look real quick back at verse 34. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. For what? Because he's good. So you're content. Because he's good. But this verse carries over into verse 35 because we acknowledge our need for salvation. We say, save us, O oh God. In verse 35 and in 36, it says, all the people. Now, the only way that all the people can praise is because we finally found contentment in God. We finally understand. We finally achieve. We finally feel that we can all praise God united in our faith, in our love, in our adoration for God. But we've got to be at peace with that. We've got to recognize and acknowledge who God is truly in our lives. He is our what? Our Savior. That's why we need salvation. Because there's days in the week when we don't feel like we need to recognize who God is. We feel like we don't need to acknowledge who God is. And sometimes we don't live our life in a way that honors God. But look at the need for salvation. We see that in verse 35. Looking at verse 35, it says, And say ye, save us, O God, of our salvation. We say, save us. We know that God is our Savior. But look at what we do, what we do. We gather together. Look what it says. And look at the text. It says again, what does God do? He delivers us from the heathen. Now, we need protection from God, for, for, from God, from our enemies. He needs to protect us, save us, and keep us from all harm, hurt, and danger. And he does just that. How do we know that? He delivers us from the heathen. Now, just in case you didn't know who the heathen 
heathen is, that's our enemies. Anybody that is in opposition to God or who does not believe in God. So what we're supposed to do is what? Trust in God for his deliverance. And then once he delivers us from our enemies, look what the text says we should do. That we may give thanks to thy holy name. All the much missed the opportunity to shout right there. And then it says at the last part, glory and praise. So think about it. You give thanks to his holy name and then you give him praise. We're supposed to give him thanks. And here's why we give him thanks. Because remember that he is what? Holy. Not the guy upstairs. I heard that term, so, you know, the big guy upstairs. You know, he's, he's not really looking out for me. Really? Well, maybe if you stop calling him the big guy upstairs and recognize who he truly is. Your Lord, your God, your Redeemer. That's who he is. You got to remember that he's holy. You can't treat God any old way. The last time somebody did that, go look at it in the limitations. I think it's either three or ten. The sons of Aaron treated God any old way. And the first thing God did was send down fire and consume them. And then God told Aaron through Moses, he said, the reason why I did it is because I'm God and I must be treated holy. Amen. Period. He didn't go any further than that in his justification. I killed your sons because they disrespected me. Now, I know everybody here group of parents similar to mine. The first time you disrespected your parents, kapow. <laughs> Or a kapow. Either way it goes. You might have been walking with a limp. You might have been holding on your bottom for a while. Or you might have had a little cranial problem. Whatever the case may be. But there's one thing. You never forgot that your mom was your mom or your dad was your dad. Hello? Same thing with God. When you disrespect God and forget that he is holy, he will remind you who he truly is. So there has never been a time, nor will there ever be a time where there's a time when we don't have a God like our God. So we should give him thanks to his holy name. We should give glory to his name. We should give him praise. And to what name is that? Well, brothers and sisters, I call him friend. Sometimes I call him Abba, Father. Sometimes I call him Lord. Sometimes I call him God. Say his sweet name with me. Somebody say Jesus. There is no other name by which man can be saved. There is no other name by which woman can be saved but by his name. You see, the Bible says, I ain't making this up. The Bible says there's power in his name. There's joy in his name. There's peace in his name. I don't know about you, but I love to praise his name. I love to call on my Jesus. I love his holy name. But don't miss the text where it says the sacred Lord. Verse 36. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel forever and ever. And all the people said, Amen. And all the people said, Amen. And here's the best part. And praise the Lord. Now, we know God is sacred because verse 34, 35 told us that he is holy. And that makes God sacred. But we are told to bless the Lord in verse 36. Why? Because he is the Lord, God of Israel. But look at how long we should be blessing him. It says forever. But let me reemphasize that point. It says forever and ever. Meaning for all eternity without end. But look at the text. How the people are in agreement with this statement. It's hard to get people to agree on anything. You want to order a pizza. Some people want pepperoni. Some people want sausage. Some people want cheese. It's hard to get people to agree with anything. Some people want vanilla ice cream. Some people want chocolate. Some people want butter pecan. You can't please everybody. But right here in the text, we see one thing. Everybody is in agreement. Go back to verse 35. Look at the pronouns. All the pronouns in verses 35 are in the plural form, meaning everyone is in agreement. You see, Ms. Brooke, it says, save us, Sasha, O God of our salvation. Gather us, Sister Stewart, together and deliver us, Ms. Jean, from the heathen, that we may, Ms. Minerva, give thanks to thy holy name. You see, don't miss this. It's everybody in agreement. Verse 36, who's blessing the Lord? All the people said amen and praise the Lord. Not one person, not half the people, a third of the people, all the people. 
But how do we know they are all united in their praise together for one accord? The word amen means everyone, it shall be so. Everyone is agreeing what should be done. Let everyone, watch this, look at everyone, will be praising the Lord. Oh, somebody missed the opportunity to shout right there. You see, Brother Kevin, we should be giving God glory. In verse 35, it tells us a clear command to do so. And the order is clear. The command has been given. You see, Sister Stewart, we are to give thanks to thy holy name. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. We are to give him glory. Somebody say, glory. We are to give him praise. Somebody say, hallelujah. And praise the Lord. How long are we supposed to do this, my friends? Marjorie, look at what it says. Forever and what? Ever. And all the people said what? Amen. And then they said what? Praise the Lord. Oh, y'all don't stop me now. Somebody say amen. amen. And praise the Lord. Praise Lord. One more time on the screen, please, if you would. You see, my life application point is this. Hit it. In everything, everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, some versions say circumstances. Some versions say situations. King James says everything. That sums it up for me. Because in the good, in the bad, and yeah, I have another phrase, the ugly. If you haven't watched that Western with Clint Eastwood, it's a good one. But the good, the bad, and in the ugly. Because there are going to be some ugly times. And you're going to feel like Eeyore. But you can't remain Eeyore-ish throughout the whole time. You have your moment of sadness, but then you got to remember that in everything, it doesn't say it has to be a good time. It doesn't say it has to be a bad time or the ugly time. You got to be thankful in every situation, at every circumstance. You got to be thankful. That's a command from God. But here's the reason why. Look at that word. Oh, there's that word is again. That's in the present tense. That means right now. And even though tomorrow might come tomorrow, yesterday be yesterday, but it's still in the present tense. You got to be thankful. Why? Because it's in the will of God in Christ Jesus. And if it's in the will of God in Christ Jesus, oh, watch how personal it gets. It's for why, oh, and for you. Amen. Don't miss that. It's personalized. It's just for you. I'm not making it up. That's what the scripture says. For you. So when we take these things into our comprehension, into our mind sense, when we get cerebral about it, when we start thinking hard about it, it's all about you. God is loving on you and you and you and you. Don't miss that. Before I close, the reason why the scripture is the way it is, we have to recall, remind, remember forward, bring forward into your minds yesterday's blessings to help us through today's hardships. We got to remember God's actions in our lives that will help you cultivate. It will help you grow, build a grateful heart. When we cease, stop giving thanks to the Lord, when we start complaining, whining, and groaning about every situation, bad or good, in our lives, I've seen people get good things blessed upon them, and they still complain. I, I, you can win a lotto, get $99 million. Why didn't I get the $1 for the $1 million? Come on now. When you complain, groan and whine, you're being ungrateful and ingrate because you forgot what God has done for you. How can you forget what God has done for you? When he woke you up this morning, how? can you forget what God has done for you when you were able to make it here alive safely yeah. think about that we pass by people getting in accidents every day You, hey, I know a guy right here in the first row got hit by a car the truck hit him head on right yeah come on think about that if you survived at least one vehicle accident raise your hand I was trapped underneath a, 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 on a motorcycle I was trapped underneath a car one time. It wasn't a pretty thing. Be clear about it. If you survive an accident, if you survive an illness, if you survive an operation, come on, give God some glory. Go back 
got one slide, real quick. It's the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. For you. For you. For you. You can't get any more. Per if we have a, per we always talk about we have a personal savior. You can't get more personal than that because he didn't put he didn't put a name on that. Paul didn't put a person's name specifically. He was talking to the Thessalonians, the people who live in the city of Thessalonica, which was under persecution. But he's telling them for you. He didn't put the, the preacher's name on there. He didn't put the deacon's name on there. He didn't put the individual person in the third or fourth or fifth or back row, the front row, the side row. He made this for the time when he wrote it 2,000 years ago for today for Y-O-N-U.